Hello, welcome to Gateway, where we love everyone life by life. We want you to know that wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. So with open hearts, let's enjoy some great music together.
Well, welcome to Gateway. We're so glad that you have joined us online. And here's the key. Everybody is online this weekend. My name is Carlos Ortiz. I'm our North Campus pastor. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be with you. Many of you already call Gateway home. And a lot of you, you've never been to Gateway, but we're so glad that you've joined us. Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you're at a barbecue. Maybe you're on somebody's boat. Who knows where you are? But we're just glad that you're with us. Now, Now today is, is the first of a few weeks coming up that you don't really want to miss, whether you call Gateway Home or it's your first time here, because today is a standalone message, a little encouragement for you, but the weeks to come is going to be our Voices series, and you're going to hear more about that towards the end of uh, the service, but I want you to know you don't want to miss it. Uh, we have a great speaker next week and the weeks to come. It's going to be exciting. You don't want to miss out, but this weekend, this weekend alone, we've designated as our The Church Has Left the Building Weekend. And, and here, here's why we did that. We felt like life is so much better done in relationship. And yeah, we're going to still have services and we're still going to have campuses and all the things that we do across Austin. But we thought, why not take a weekend, especially the 4th of July weekend, where people have time with family and friends, they're with their community, maybe they're out of town, they're doing what they do. Why don't we ask people who call Gateway Home to be the church? 
And what does that mean? What does it mean to be the church? It means that we don't rely on a building. We don't rely on all the cameras and the lights, even though that's what we're doing in this moment, because this is just a small, minor part of what it means to be the church. What it means to be the church is what you're doing right now. It's being with people you love. It's having food and doing all the things that you do. And we're going to take a few minutes to talk about what does it truly mean to be the church. Now, I want you to know this is not the first time we're doing this. It's not the first time we're being the church. Uh, we're, we're just coming out of a pandemic, and many of you, hundreds of you, got out of your homes and you helped people that needed help, or maybe you part, were part of Feed the Community at one of our campuses where we fed thousands of people over the last 18 months. Many of you gave resources, food, money to make a difference. And then, on top of all that, we had a winter storm for the ages. And many of you got out with your cars and your trucks and helped people. You got out help helped apartment complexes get water. You gave of your resources. We gave out diapers. We gave out food for babies. We did all sorts of things. So being in the church is not anything new here at Gateway. But doing it in this way is new to us. So why not? Why not be as crazy as we are? And you might be thinking if this is your first time checking out Gateway, these people are a little nuts. Yeah, we actually are, but we can embrace that. It's okay. Because most churches may not do something like this. Most places may not necessarily change up the formula or the format. But about two months ago, the, the leadership, we sat down and talked and we said, why not try things new? What did we learn from the pandemic? And that is people are resilient. People want to emulate what it means to be Jesus. So why not have a weekend where we do that together? So what does it truly look like? What does it mean to really understand what we're doing this weekend? What is the question we're trying to answer? So if we go to Acts chapter two, it's a book of the Bible, it's the second chapter, we're gonna read a few scriptures. But before we do that, let me go into the story ahead of time. What's happening in the first part of this chapter is that there's incredible people who are preaching God's word. And a lot of people come to know Jesus because these incredible people are empowered by what we call the Holy Spirit of God. And as they preach, people are compelled and want to know who God is. There's amazing things already happening. A lot like we do on a weekend. Somebody gets up and teaches and there's music and there's great things for kids and students. And people get to grow in community and get to learn about God. But what we find at the end of chapter two, chapter two is actually the secret sauce of why the early church grew the way it did. So here we go. Starting in verse 42. It says, all the believers and those who actually believed in Jesus devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. The apostles were people who were disciples of Jesus. And to fellowship. And to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Verse 47 all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. What does that mean at the end, being saved? It's those who are being called out of a life in darkness and into what we call the light of knowing Jesus. Being saved from darkness and into light. But there's a lot happening here. There's actually 10 things that are happening. So I'm going to make this go as quick as I can because I want to make sure you enjoy our time together. There's 10 things that happen that we can learn from of what it really means to be part of community in a local church. So here we go. Ready? Number one, a devotion to learning. And when we come together and we learn and we're challenged by one another, we're devoted and we're committed to learning through Scripture. 1 Timothy 4.13 says this, Until I get there, focus on reading the Scriptures to the church and encouraging the believers and teaching them. So as a pastor, we teach out of Scripture because what we, we want people to learn and to grow together. So you devote yourself to learning. The second thing you do as a church is, is you invest time in one another. If you, if you read that passage, it said they devoted time to one another. There were touch points every single day that they were in relationship. Now, granted, it was a different time. 
Most people were in villages, were in cities. Most people were, were stayed in one place and, and, and put down roots. We're transient. We move because of job opportunities and things that are happening. But it doesn't matter. They had a mindset and a heart that really said, we're going to know our neighbor. And they had daily touch points. So when I was a sophomore in college, I, I, I grew to know Jesus. And I made a commitment to follow Jesus, to leave that, that dark world and live in the light. And so the, the first two years, I was at the church every single day, like the church facility, the building itself. I, nobody required me to do that. It wasn't part of some spiritual growth, but I was so hungry to be in relationship with people that I went to the place I knew where people were growing, and that was the church building. And it took me a while to realize that the church building wasn't going to help me grow. It was the people I was going to be in relationship with. So it, they had daily touch points. And that, that speaks to me because as I was wanting to grow in God and really learn who God was, because I didn't believe in God for a long time, for most of my life. So once I committed, I was like, okay, if I want to know this God, I want to learn who this God is. And I was hungry and thirsty to know more about God. And I had daily touch points. Can you imagine you're dating somebody for the first time and you commit to dating and you don't talk regularly? What kind of relationship are you really going to build? It's those daily touch points of being in community that make a difference. I have a group of friends that we text all the time. And, and we, we share a lot of videos and fun things and jokes and all those kind of things. But they're daily touch points that keep us connected to know that we are there for one another. And that's what we want to do in the local church is have touch points where people know we are doing life together. The third thing is actually my favorite thing. Food was front and center to their relationships. Food was front and center to their relationships. And most of us come from cultures where food's really important, but some of us don't. And I got to tell you, the fact that they broke bread together, that every time they got together, they had food. It was at the center because food brings intimacy. You're trusting somebody to make a plate for you. You're trusting somebody to serve you. You're doing life together. You're enjoying something. You're finding pleasure in food together. Food is right in the middle. And many of you are actually sharing a meal right now. Somebody's at the grill or somebody ordered some food or somebody made some sandwiches because food is important to our being. We need it for sustenance. So why not do that with other people that we care about? I love this quote from Jonathan Four, he says, food is not rational. Food is culture, habit, craving, and identity. I don't know about you, but some, some of you moms probably cook some incredible dishes, and when people leave your house, they probably smell like your food. Like, that's a good home-cooked meal. When somebody leaves your house and they smell like your food, or when you wake up the next morning and your house smells like the dinner the night before, that's when you know you had a really good meal. And that's when these people knew that they were building bonds together, when there was food in the middle of all of it. And that's something you don't think about with local church. You think of whatever the news media says or whatever somebody says or somebody's experienced, but I gotta tell you, food is important. Matter of fact, my daughter the other day, she's turning 15 uh, in a few weeks, and she said, for my 15th birthday, I want so-and-so's chicken, and I want so-and-so's macaroni and cheese, and I want so-and-so. And she went down the list of people that we do life with and the food they make. And as a dad, that warmed my heart that for her birthday, she wanted food from people in our community that she cares about because she loves their food. It's at the center of what we do. It's important. The fourth thing we learned from this passage is prayer was expected. Prayer was expected. And I know sometimes we think of prayer as like we go before God and we have like this laundry list of things. And we're like, okay, God, so let me uh, ask you for these 10 things and this is what I need. But no, prayer that we're talking about is this prayer as devotion, as surrender, as dependence on God. It's communication. And I wonder if more of us would pray if we knew that all we're doing is just having a conversation with God. We're not asking him for a laundry list. We're not begging for something. We're just letting him know what's in the, in the recesses of our heart. Prayer was expected. How about this, number five? They were in awe of what God was doing. 
They were in awe. They never got used to the miracles. They never got used to everything that was happening. They never got used to all the amazing supernatural things that were taking place. They kept their awe and wonder. And how many times do we lose our awe, whether it's of God or life or relationships, we lose our awe. And I wonder if we could get that back. We get back to understanding that the life we get to live is pretty amazing. Yeah, there might be things happening that aren't so amazing. But we live in a time and an age where so many great things are happening. Can we, can we regain a sense of awe when it comes to who God wants to be in our life? Maybe you've been burned by the church. You've been burned by people in the church. Most of us have. But are we allowing that to rob us of this amazing future that God might have for us? Number six, they worked to have things in common. Look at, listen to that phrase. They worked to have things in common. They understood that unity did not come naturally. It came with a series of meeting in the middle type of moments. You have to work to find unity. And I know we live in a culture where you pick a side. Hey, what do you believe? And you can take all these quizzes online of what you believe on different issues. And it tells you how to vote. And it tells you the kind of people you should be hanging out with. And I think that's just all... A bunch of BS, if I'm going to be honest with you. Because the truth is, life doesn't work that way. The truth is, we are called to work. To work in being in relationship with one another. To find the thing we actually have in common. And I guarantee if you and I sat down over coffee or a meal, we could have something in common. But we'd have to work at it. I wonder how many of us are tired of everything that's taken place over the last few years. And so we're not working at building a relationship. But we're the ones who lose out when we do that. All right, how about this? Number seven, material possessions were a resource for communal living. They looked at their stuff as belonging to everybody else. So they sold stuff and they helped each other and they helped the poor and they helped the widows and those who were in need and those who had more felt like they had more responsibility to help take care of other people. And I wonder if we can embrace this notion that what we have isn't really ours anyway. I've, I have clothes in my closet, and in the coming weeks, we've already talked about cleaning out our closets and helping out people who might need these clothes and giving clothes away because if I don't, I become a hoarder of my goods. And when I hoard my goods, they actually have no value anymore. The return on investment diminishes. If I have 150 shirts, I don't. But if I had 150 shirts, that, can, that means I could wear one every three years. What value does that shirt have anymore? But the value of that shirt could increase if I gave 10, 15, 20 of those shirts to somebody who only had one shirt. Because they would see it more valuable than I do. They saw their stuff, their possessions as communal living. It was a means to an end. It was not the end. And I wonder if we look at our material stuff as the end, as though we've made it when we have X or Y or Z. And I wonder if we could switch that thinking to say, man, I have this stuff and it's cool. But if I sold it or if I did this, I could help this many people. This is how the church was meant to look at material goods. Then number eight, they praise God with thankfulness. For those of you who call Gateway Home, when you worship, do you go before God with thankfulness? Do you, do, you, do you sing your song? Do you maybe raise your hand? Do you stand up in service? Do you, do you put on the earbuds and, and just sing out loud as loud as you can with thankfulness? Like, God, thank you for being so good. Because worshiping God and singing songs to God is not a right. It's an act of worship. It's a sacrifice that we do, where we don't ignore our situation and circumstance, but in spite of our situation and circumstance, we lift up thanksgiving and words of praise to the God who created us. Number nine, they grew in favor with people around them. That means people saw what was happening in their life and they wanted to be around them. And I gotta ask you a question. Is there something different about you that people can see? Do you stand out? In a crowd, 
Do you ask people to lunch and they're like, man, I'd love to have lunch with you? Or do you repel people by your very presence? And, and I know it's a pretty straightforward question, but it's a question we have to ask ourselves. When we're engaging other people, do we actually engage them or do we push them away? Because what we're finding in the characteristics of the early church, they grew in favor with people around them. It means people wanted to be around them. Do people want to be around you? Do people look at you and you're full of thankfulness and you have a community and you love having food and you're grateful for everything you have? And they're like, man, I want to have a friend like that. Or do they see you and think, man, I don't even know if I want to get to know them. They're grouchy. They come into work late. They always complain about people. Maybe they gossip. See, we're asked to emulate characteristics that draw people in to relationship. And the last thing, the 10th thing is this. They grew in numbers as God drew people in. Now, if you don't normally go to church, you're like, oh, there it is. There's the mega church answer. They want to grow in numbers. Yeah, but you got to think of it in context. They grew in numbers in their community. They grew in numbers with people at the table having meals. They grew in numbers with people selling their possessions and sharing and helping one another. They grew in numbers in a way that mattered. It wasn't just butts in seats in a church building. It was they grew in numbers with people who added to their community. We live in Austin. If you're not watching from Austin, our city is going through a major boom. Thousands of homes are being built. They can't even build them all right now. There's just so much happening. But just because people are moving here doesn't mean they're actually in community. Just because they have an Austin zip code or a Leander zip code or a Buda zip code or a Dripping Springs zip code or a Pflugerville zip code doesn't mean they're actually part of a community. It doesn't mean you're actually part of a community if you're one of those people. You're in community when you begin to live out these characteristics. And until then, you're just paying for an overpriced home and a lot of tax money. Why not make it worth it? Why not build relationships and friendships that can add value to your life? We want to grow in numbers at Gateway. We want to grow in numbers of people who know one another, who serve one another, and who are willing to be the church that leaves the building every single weekend. Those are the characteristics. And I want to tell you, sometimes we see church and we go for the low-hanging fruit. It's, I want a place for my kids and I want a place for my teenagers and I want to fix my marriage. And, or maybe you, you want to grow a relationship with God for the very first time. And those are all really good things. We do that. And, and we can serve you in that way. But I want you to know there's so much more. Don't undervalue what it means to be in community in a local church especially a church like Gateway. Because if not, if you do that, you'll be like this guy. This guy named Jeremy Lockett uh, from Alden, Massachusetts. And in 2014, he, he won a lottery, his, his, he, the scratch-off lottery, and he, he won $50,000. And he was so excited, so he went to the lottery commission office, and he went to go turn in his ticket. And Jeremy was excited to get his 50 grand. Who wouldn't be excited about cashing in $50,000? The, the problem is he didn't read the actual ticket. He didn't win $50,000. He didn't even remember the ticket that he bought. So when he turned it in, they laughed and they said, Mr. Lockett, you didn't win $50,000. You won $50,000 a year for the rest of your life. And he's in shock. He didn't read the fine print. He didn't even know the value of the ticket that he had in his hand. All he wanted was the 50 grand. Now, of course, he took the money. Of course, he took the payout. And he walked away with $650,000. But he was willing to settle for a payout of $50,000 when in his hand, he had something much more valuable than that. You know what the ticket was called that he bought? It was called the Lifetime Spectacular Ticket. And I love the name of that ticket. Because when you commit to Jesus Christ, when you commit to a relationship with people who have also committed to Christ, you get a lifetime spectacular of relationships and growth 
and food and communal living and making a difference. And that's what we want for you. So no matter where you're at, no matter where you're watching, no matter who you're watching with, don't sell yourself short. This thing we call church, this thing we call the church can change your life every year for the rest of your life. The church is more than a place where we sing, where our kids can grow, where our students can go to camp, where we grow in our faith. The church is a powerful entity filled with living human beings who are each called to love and overcome the evil in this world. And you may have showed up to a to a church service at some point broken. You may have showed up to watch this, this message with some friends and you're barely making it. And yes, we are here for you. I commit to that. But you're so much more than your brokenness. You're so much more than your current pain. You're so much more than what you're searching for for your kids and your students and your marriage. You're more than that. You are made to be whole. And after your whole, to help make others whole, you were called to change your world. I can't change the people in your world, but you can. I can't make a meal for people in your neighborhood, but you can. I can't get the calls late at night when one of your neighbors is having an emergency, but you can. You're powerful. God has called you to change your world in ways that you might think are insignificant, but to others, they might be significant. So today, whatever you're doing, just be Jesus. There's an old adage, be Jesus with skin on, right? There's a scripture that says, clothe yourself in Jesus. So wherever you are, whatever you're making, whoever you're with, be the church, because the church today has left the building. Let's pray. God, I thank you for my friends who are all watching online. I thank you for new friends and old friends. I thank you for the gatherings that are taking place in families and neighbors, friends from work. I thank you for whatever's happening in their context that you would show up because we believe where two or three are gathered in your name that you show up. So every person who's in that group, surround them with your love. Every child, every teenager, every young adult, every college student, surround them with your love and let them know there's so much more to this thing called church. And they are it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are so glad you're here. My name's Andrea Wiggins, and I'm a volunteer here at Gateway North, and I want to welcome you to our online service today. Gateway is a place where you can truly come as you are, where there's no perfect people allowed. If you're new here, we would love to know where you're watching from. Go to gatewaychurch.com slash connect and introduce yourself. We would love to meet you. If you consider Gateway your church home, then I would love to have you join us in your giving as we support Austin and our global partners. If this is your first time visiting though, we want you to feel no obligation to give. Let this service be our gift to you. We just want you to know that we're a generous church. To give, go to gatewaychurch.com slash give and then check your local campus. This is how I love to give and I love to watch how God works in and through us in our giving. Next week, don't miss our special guest, Nona Jones, as she kicks off our most popular series, Voices, that starts on July 11th. You can watch this online or at one of our live campuses, but you're not gonna wanna miss this dynamic speaker who talks about the intersection of faith and technology. So make sure you're here for that. Today, we're celebrating Independence Day, and last month, we celebrated Freedom Day. This last year has been such a great reminder for us not to take our freedoms for granted. So if you're in the armed services, if you're a doctor, a nurse, a teacher, a school bus driver, a grocery store clerk, we want to say thank you so much for all you've done to help us enjoy our freedom this last year.